this last winter, I was sitting in the house, and it was raining on both sides of the house. It never does that in Washington, right? Just one, usually. You can usually go out to one side of the house and it's dry, but the other side's wet. Not this day, it was raining on both sides. And I got to surfing through the internet on beekeeping groups, and I found these folks up north, and I, they were uh, advertising their AZ. And I went, you know, that might be kind of interesting. So I called the contact person, which is Deborah Langley, correct? Langley yeah. But I answered to all of those. Oh, did? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I spoke with her at length a time or two over the phone, emailed her a couple of times. I told her our secretary, well there she is, would contact her and set up the, uh, the time and the venue for them and, and whatnot. We passed it through the board, the board liked it, which reminds me, if you guys ever have any kind of a topic or anything that we, you would like to hear about, please bring it to because there are certain times in the year that we do struggle sometimes to try and find meeting topics. So bring us ideas, please. You know, I mean, we've got a schedule now for the rest of the year. So anyhow, Suzanne contacted them, so here they are. <clears throat> Deborah and Dana. Dana? Dana. Dana. They're going to talk for the next hour. Please hold your questions till the end if you can so they can get through the presentation. And they also have a donation cup up front for their apiary. They have 30 hives in their apiary. So, um, further ado, Deborah. Well, thank you. So, to start out with, I want to thank everybody for letting us come. Uh, there's a reason we're doing this, which goes to kind of who I am, is why an easy hive? Well, I started out, and my first little class was, of course, learning about a Langston hive. And I said, lifting? Yeah, I don't know if I can have these. And then I looked at where I live, and I thought, 150 inches of rain, hostile environment, nothing but nothing but woods around me. And I do mean woods, hundreds of acres around me. And I was thinking, boy, I don't know. And then, on Mother Earth News, I, my husband gets the magazine, and he says, hey, look at this. It was a Slovenian AZ hive. And I looked at that, and the light bulb went on, and I went, yes, this is it. And you'll see why. One, no lifting. No lifting. That's my favorite part about the whole thing. Second favorite part, it's in a bee house or a shelter. Hence, I get protected from the rain when I'm working or whatever, which is the rain. And in the winter, my hive is a little bit more protected. So I kind of looked at that and said, okay. And then as I looked at it more, I thought, boy, this is nicer for the bees. And so for me, it's less disturbing when I'm looking at the bees. So my whole deal was I looked at it and said, gee, that's wonderful. I think I'll just go do that. No problem. I'll just go online. I'll get, I'll get some plans or I'll find somebody that'll, that'll make one and I'll just buy one. Tell my husband, I want you to save up, I want you to save up this much money, we want to buy beehives. He puts it in there, he says, okay, you have this much time, I'll have that money for you. And there were no plans. Except for there were a few in Slovenia. I don't speak that language. I don't read that language. Nothing. Uh, some very, very old ones, for instance, I found the only book in English on AZ Hives. A uh, little bit of information in it. And as I looked further and further, I found in uh, North America, states, there was a lady, Suzanne, in New Hampshire that sold Slovenian hives. Very nice lady. It would have only cost me 500 for the hive plus whatever is shipping. Uh, then there was a guy that was just getting started in Georgia. Again, same price, lovely hives. Uh, and then there was nothing, nothing, nothing. And then by the time I, I figured out I was designing, doing my own, and as I got started and I'm designing my start building, there was a guy in Texas. Um, that was pretty much it when I started. And so I started, there was no information, there was no place to find anything. And I, I said, this is what I'm doing, and I had to figure it out. So I went to my club. And 
then naturally I don't like to start anything normal. And so I said, they said, so you're going to get a nice leg strip pipe? No, no, I don't want to lift it. So you're going with a top bar? No, I'm going with an, a Slovenian AZ hop. And they say, what? And I explained it and I infected Dana. <laughs> and so now Dana. So one of the reasons I got into AZ hives is I learned about them from Deborah, but I really thought that they would help protect the bees in our winter climate. Um, the other thing is, I'm getting older, I don't want to lift 100 pound honey supers. And so in order to make sure I inspect the bees at a proper rate, I wanted something that was easier to work with. The other challenge that I have is bears. So by having it in a bee house, I can put electric wire around the bee house, and so I got two more layers of protection against the bears. And so far, this works just fine. They haven't gotten into them. Previously, I was keeping them on top of my well house, which is 17 feet high and two ladders to climb up. And it, just, it, was, it was not conducive to good beekeeping. And then I also think that they were much more exposed to the wind during the wintertime, even though there was a small parapet wall. So that's really why I got into it. And so Deborah told me about them a year ago, December. So between December and, and the beginning of the beekeeping season last year, I had to figure out how to build hives. Deborah did the same thing. We didn't build exactly the same, uh, but we built to the same principles. So they, they, they work the same. They're just slightly different sizes and materials, but we found that our frames are interchangeable. So we can swap frames between our hives if we need to. So that's why I got into the Slovenian hives. And after one month of having them, I said, I'm not doing Langstroth again, ever. <laughs> so I really like the way that they work. Yeah, which is the same thing. I worked the club hives and I said, eh. Not happening. So our schedule for tonight is I'm going to talk about history, kind of get you started so you kind of understand where it's coming from, the whole flow, why, why they went this way in Slovenia and Europe, and kind of the difference there. Uh, Dana's going to go over some high elements. He's going to go over detail. He's taking things apart, okay? and show you exactly how the whole inside works on the hive and all the way through the bee house. And so including some hive tools and stuff, during this, we'll give you little bits and pieces about our hives and what's, what we've been doing and that sort of thing. Uh, I have a couple things we need. One is we're holding questions because we found out the questions that we get are exactly what we're talking about. And that, that you just missed it, it was the next slide. And second one, this is a large room. We want to make sure that everybody hears. So up in the back, if you suddenly can't hear me or you can't hear Dana, I want you to start doing this with your ears. If you start waving your hand, we'll think you have a question. But if you start doing this, and maybe stand up and say, you're not paying attention to me, this then we'll know we're not talking loud enough. This group will throw things at you. That, that's why I'm using the clue. I've had things thrown at me before. I worked with um, teenagers, you know, middle school specifically. So, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. I can handle that. No problem. So that's kind of, kind of how we'll proceed. So we'll start right away with the history. Uh, mostly Europe, uh, Slovenian is where I'm talking. We've got to go way, way back to the 6th century. Talking like year 500, 600, you know, Middle Ages. Not a very good time. So what they started with is they were carrying logs. They're called gums. And they have their bees in them. So you carry your log, you go to a new place, you put your gum down, and you got your beehive. That way you can have your honey. Kind of long. So they had carnelian bees as they move on. Then the next thing you know, the logs begin to get placed in shelters. They're not moving around so much, so they're getting some shelters. And then from there, they're moving to wooden bee houses on farms. So it's kind of shifting, and you can see how it's, how it's developing, and which flows right into what we've got. Then you move clear to the 18th century. They didn't do a lot of changes, apparently, in between that I could find out. Uh, that's your 1700s, 1800s. They call it the Enlightenment time, uh, Napoleon, George Washington, you know, that kind of time frame. So they start with these panels, and you can't see, but they, they're little tiny panels on the front of all the hives, and each hive has, has a panel on it. They're sometimes simple, they're sometimes elaborate, they're little stories, they might be history, they might be a little religious thing. But they're, they're something that people can walk by and go, oh yeah, that's what they got on their hive. And so they have kind of out for people to look at. They also found that the bees related to that picture. And so they would come back to their hive because they'll have a whole bunch of them. And so it was a matter of, of finding it. 
Uh, today, there are trips just to go look at the pants. And that's what they do. They just travel around Europe and Slovenia and they look at pants. And so it's, it's a you know, real big deal. As we go on, uh, Slovenia has a really long history with beekeeping. They're, it's the big thing in their country. It's big enough that they have, in 1700s, we're still in that area, uh, the first beekeeping school in Vienna, who they hired was Anton Jansa, and he was, <coughs> people call him like the father of, of the uh, modern uh, beekeeping. He was a painter, he was a teacher, so he had this big thing. What you'll see is World Bee Day is May 20th. That's the United Nations did that. The reason they picked that date was because it's his birthday. And so that's how important this one is in that area, if you've got that. Um, we are doing an AZ Hive Day at my house, Saturday the 19th, not the 20th, uh, to celebrate that and just a little bit more learning. We go through my hive and just kind of share and people that are doing AZ Hives are interested to get together and, and we can chat. So I'm doing that if you're interested. That's the half page flyer over there. So they kind of set it up that it's really key. Then in 1906, Benton comes, and he's been in the States, and they've got the Langstrumpf hive, and he brings it on in to Slovenia, and guess what? They didn't like it. It did not fit who they were. Remember the bee houses, uh, the panels, okay? the whole thing? It wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't, they couldn't, they couldn't carry it around, and they weren't real pleased with it. So they did not adapt it. You'll, obviously, you'll see them in Europe, around about, but you'll see a lot more of the AZ. So who invented them? Now, it's another Anton. And if you speak Slovenian, it'd be really nice if you taught me how to say his name. Uh, because I have not figured it out, but I'm sure it's good. Zenderzik. Zenderzik. Anyway, in 19... the whole thing over the sea. So yes, and I, and I don't have a thing on the right way. Yeah. Yeah, we got one of those. Uh, and that's in 1910. Uh, AZ High, named for AZ. Uh, he, what he did was, he did a lot of research. He was, you know, kind of an inventor, loved bees, really wanted to do that. Uh, looked at, like, Italian <coughs> hives and German hives and the different ones, and the Langstrumpf hive. And he took that stuff and made one that fit their traditional hives. So it had the bee house, it had the panel on it, it opened up from the back. So it, it fit the things that they wanted and it fit them. And that's kind of how it began on that. It was designed, part of it is you're looking at the bee house. It's all about the harsh climate. And the whole thing is the weather in some places isn't very nice and they need a little more protection. So the bee house is fairly important. The entire design of it is important how it goes. You'll find them in Slovenia, Austria, Switzerland, Northern Italy, Germany. All have, played, all have these AZ houses. Then, if you continue doing a little more research, you find the name Slovenian, AZ for the namesake. A rear loader. I was emailing and chatting with somebody and found out that uh, Holland calls them rear loaders, a back door hive. In the U.S., we don't quite have it. You'll hear some people say Spanian, some people say AZ. I think I've decided AZ U.S. I, I, we keep, there's a lot of discussion that goes on what should we call them here because we have done them a little bit different, which you'll see. And for me, the second part, not just the shelter things, it's the no heavy lifting. I'm not lifting. I'm doing one frame. I'm sliding frames in and out. Uh, they're for old beekeepers, Slovenia, that's who tends them, because they don't have to do that heavy work. Uh, the hive doesn't tend to be emptied, although I emptied mine out recently. It, and so what happens is you work on one chamber at a time, whichever one you want. Sometimes the queen is a little bit sneaky, and I have one that's a real snotty queen. And they'll just go someplace that you're not. You look there, 
and, and then you put it back, and that's where she goes, because she doesn't want you to see her. It's really not very nice. Uh, and they also do, people always say, do they propolize and put bird comb? Of course they do. They're bees. They do, they do exactly what they want when they want. Do they see something that they can seal? Oh yeah, they seal everything they can. Do they say, do I want bird comb go from here to here? Naturally they do that. I, because they're bees. And so the deal is you have to tend them just like you do any other hive. But what I have found is disconnecting what they have done is easy because there's less content points. And so, so it's not too hard to disconnect it. I did just take from our club hive, they decided to connect all kinds of things with bird comb. And to disconnect it, I went and it kind of just separated and then I pulled it out. And so they're, they're really not that difficult to work with as I'm finding and they're doing their bee thing. Uh, there is less places for them to propolize uh, and just as many places for them to bird comb and stick, and stick between the chambers and stuff. So that's kind of, kind of with that, then we get to trade places. And I saw something interesting in one of my hives this year is usually they'll, uh, they'll build their burr comb at the top between the chambers. And one of mine this year, it's the first time I've seen it, they built at the bottom between the, the rods that are at the bottom and then the, the, the separator board. So you see something different all the time. These are not consistent. So what I'm going to be showing you here is this is the equivalent of a five frame nuke. Uh, it's much easier to carry than a 10 frame nuke. So, and most of the things that are on here are uh, to allow me to show you the uh, principles of the hive. So, what I have facing towards you guys right now is the front. Uh, on, on the full-size hives that I make, the landing board is about 10 inches wide and has a full opening. Uh, but, uh, and on the uh, hives, the front doesn't lift off, but I made this one removable so that you can see the front part is the only part that's exposed to the weather. And so it's got a solid front, then it's got a three-quarter inch to inch gap, and then it's got another solid three-quarter inch piece. So they're pretty well insulated from the weather on the exterior of the hive. So these are a cabinet style, so the bees go in the front. The uh, beekeeper actually works the rear of the hive, and I'll try and do this so as many people can see as possible. And I'm hoping that after we take questions at the end, there might be a few minutes for those of you that want to come actually put your hands on these and try sliding a frame in and out. I find we get a new and additional questions if people actually get their hands on it. So the beekeeper goes inside the building to work the highs, which is nice because you're out of the rain. So if you had a day like today where it was relatively warm, not as warm as we would have liked it, but had rain showers off and on, you can go in the bee house and you can pull frames out and put them in your stand and not worry about them getting rained on. So it's really kind of nice so it, and it tends to disturb the chamber. So these stack just like Langstroth hives. If you buy a traditional Slovenian hive, they're usually two chamber. Um, here in the U.S. most of us are building in three chambers. Uh, Deborah builds hers four chambers. But one of the nice things is when you go in the bee house to work the bees is you open the back door. And then you can see there's a screen frame in here. And each chamber has its own frame. So if all you want to do is, maybe your brood chamber's in the bottom chamber, and all you want to do is check the brood that day, you can pull that out. And you access that by removing this inner screen door. And you can see that there's metal spacers here, and there's metal spacers at the back. That's what keeps the frame spaced apart, and so they're never touching each other. And they have just a very thin piece of metal for the bees to propolize onto. The uh, frames, then when you go to work the bees, slide in and out. Once they propolize them, sometimes you need to take a high tool and just give them a slight twist, but most of the time I can just take my thumb and push it. And then what you do is you slide the frame out. And you just need to do it slowly to keep from crushing bees. Uh, and sometimes I'll just pull it out to here while I'm sitting down, look at both sides, and if I see what I need to, I'll push it back in. Uh, but we also can put a board underneath so that you can take the frames and look at them. And the frames have a uh, 
concave surface to the top and the bottom. Yeah, notice he said he was sitting down. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's so that when there's those three rods inside, there's very minimal space for them to propolize. If these were flat, they could glue them down pretty good. And really, the only tricky part about these is slide the frames back in because you've got to hit the spacer in the back. And it just takes a little bit of practice. Every once in a blue moon when I pull a bunch of frames out, I put nine in and it's like, huh, there's no more slots. And so you've got to take a flashlight and look to see where you missed. But that's one of the reasons why sometimes I'll usually pull one frame out from the side because there's typically, they don't do a lot on it. I'll set that aside. And then as I continue to work frames, I'll just push them to the side to give me space. And then slide them out, look at them, slide them back in, push it to the side. But they do make stands and you can put 10 frames in. So if you want to pull them all out, that's why Deb was mentioning that often we'll check these frames and the queen might be on the second level and then we open the second level and she goes down to the first level. So sometimes spotting the queens in these hives can be a little challenging. And so if you need to find them, sometimes you do need to pull them all out and put them on that stand. Uh, also, these have been designed to keep the 3 8 B space. So there's, there's 3 8 pretty much at the bottom and at the sides and at the top. So we're still trying to maintain what the bees like to have. Just trying to make sure I don't forget stuff. So you can't see it from up there, but if, if we get a chance afterwards, we can pull it. But there's three 3 8 rods here that sit. And then there's a space below that uh, where we can put uh, some different separators. Also, I mentioned that these have a round. So it's really handy if you have a round scraper. But I only typically use this a couple of times a year. It's usually not a big issue. And then you can use this side of this or the flat scraper if you need to scrape the sides. You also have some other parts that go with this. In the winter time, these are ventilation flaps. You can open these up. So in the winter time, you open the ventilation flaps and you actually put a solid piece of this foam all the way across the back. And then what that does is it allows some ventilation through the hive in the wintertime to pull the moisture out. Uh, but by having it in the bee house, you don't have so much ventilation that it cools the bees too. <coughs> so that's kind of really a handy feature. And one of the things I've changed on my current design, I learned this year, with these little flaps, it's hard to put a piece of screening across here. And I had mice get into one of my hives and just decimate it. So on my newer models and larger doors, I'm just cutting an opening so that I can put 8th inch hardware cloth over that. And I'm also switching my inner covers over to 8th inch hardware cloth to just really keep the mice out there. So as we do these things, we learn. And we'll continue to learn. Um, there's also, between each chamber, and you can see uh, in some of these, we have three different kinds of separator boards. And for this demo, I only get a combo of two. So between each hive, you can put a solid board. That's this section here. So you could even, if you wanted to, if you had a, a 30 chamber, 10, 10, and 10, you could put one queen in each chamber, I wouldn't recommend it, by putting the solid board in. And then same thing in the wintertime, if you were at 30, you know, 10, three chambers of 10, you can put this off and block them off to just 10 or to just 20. Uh, but when you're working with the bees in it and you want them to go between, you need to pull that board out. Well, now I have 3 eighths space below there, the 3 eighths for the board and 3 eighths above. So make a slotted board that can slide in there so that we still are keeping 3 8 above and below. And usually it works great. Like I say, I had one hive this year that decided that they were going to go between the bottom of the frames and right here and build lots of bird comb. <laughs> so it's pretty easy to scrape off. You also have the option, if you want to, you can put a tray in the bottom. Uh, they do have screen bottoms. Some people like screen bottoms, some don't. But this way you can either have the bottom open or closed. One of the things I found is if you stack these three chambers high and then the second three chambers on top, having a screen bottom on the top one doesn't do you much good. So you have a solid bottom below here. I also found last year, April was really cold. And my hive, I, just because I'm trying to learn, uh, I did one hive with the screen bottom open and one closed. And the one with the bottom open didn't perform very well at all. And what I think was happening is they were just a little bit colder they were spending more time clustering rather than getting out and building and working. Uh, about a month later, I said, they're not doing as well. I put the solid bottom in and immediately they picked up. I don't know if it's because of the solid bottom or because it was June and it had warmed up. 
So now when I put my V's in, I'm just leaving the solid bottom in there and just, you know, what little bit of ventilation comes through the back is what's going to work best for me. Feeders go inside the cabinet. This is a really nice feature of all you're going to do that day is feed your V's. You go into the bee house, you pop open the door, this feeder is sitting on here against that inner cover. Um, and there's very few, if any, bees in here. You just pull the jar out, put the other jar in, and close it up, and you're done. If you're not going to inspect that day. So if you just want to feed, I used to go in without any protective gear. I've since found that I'm severely allergic to bees. So even just to feed now, I at least put on a lightweight suit. Because uh, I don't want to get any worse reaction. And I do have an EpiPen, and I carry that. So, but, so the feeders are really kind of convenient. One thing to note, because we do the wire on the bottom, if you use a ball jar with a removable two-part lid, that lid is indented. So if you're going to use that style of lid, you need to invert it, put it upside down, so it's closer to the screen, so it's not leaving a gap that the bees have to reach across. Yeah, they can't reach it, actually. Um, bee straws. So we talked about the door ventilation. So, bee house. Um, one of the reasons I made the model is the first couple times we talked, we just brought this and said they went to bee house, and everyone's going, hey, what's a bee house? What does it look like? So I felt that it was really good to have an example. This is kind of designed on a Slovenian bee house. This is 112 scale. So this would be an 8 by 10 foot bee house. I made my first one 6 by 8, way too small. 8 by 10 is the smallest I would recommend if you're going to build a full internal bee house. So the, uh, and also you notice, I did not do this when I built the bee house, but one of the things that they've done with this design is to increase the airflow across the front. And if you look up Slovenian statistics, their honey is usually about 2% less moisture than ours. They call our honey watery. <laughs> so, uh, so it does dry it out, and part of that is the way the ventilation are designed in these buildings. And I didn't try and perfectly mimic their building. I just really wanted a shelter that worked for me. So I built more of a traditional design. But you can see here, I've colored the hives. So you can, this would be 10, 30 chamber, 30 frame hives. And when the beekeeper goes inside, you come in, and when you want to work a hive, you open that door. And then you open the inner cover that you want to work. Uh, and then you close it back up and go to the next one. Also, one thing I should mention, which I did when I was on the hive, I did go ahead and purchase, the first few hives I made with just regular butt hinges, worked fine, but I knew it was going to potentially be an issue. They make these really nice hinges that are a pintle style. So if this door's in your way and you want to maybe move frames between, you just lift the door off and set it aside, or if you need to work on it. So these are really, really handy hinges. Now that I've bought them, I won't use anything else. I did it, Jim. <laughs> so one of the nice things about the bee house I mentioned before is it does protect you from the rain, but also the wind and the sun when it's really sunny. And you can see there's multiple different styles of bee houses here. Um, and they also make them mobile. So we've got a couple of pictures. And again, you can find every variation um, that's out there. The other thing is you typically don't want a window in your bee house. So one of the things you need to think about if you design a bee house is putting a light in. And I put a, a small solar light and I quickly said, I can't see those eggs and I put a much brighter one. So here's one of the trucks that they use and these trucks actually have jack stands and they'll drive it out to wherever they want the bees, they'll jack it up and then drive the truck away and just leave the trailer there for however long. So that's one of the ways they make their bee houses mobile, and they are very tight inside typically. And here's an older style on a wagon. So they aren't quite as uh, mobile as the commercial U.S. hives, and they can cram a whole ton on a truck, but they still can be mobile if you think about it. And I think we're getting pretty close to the end. Deborah has a couple of closing. What's that? Oh, I didn't go over the frames. You're right. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about, thank you for reminding me, 
Here's a traditional Langstroth deep. If you go and just buy a traditional Slovenian hive, you can see the different size of the frame. It's shorter and taller. And one of the issues with that is many of our honey extractors, this will not fit. So that's why most of us have said, we love the concept of the AC hive, but we want to adapt it to the Langstroth size foundation. And so what we have done is we've built our own frame that's pretty close in size. It uses the same foundation. You can see here it's just slightly larger. And it does not have the wide wings or the tabs for hanging. If you were to put this in a Slovenian hive, now your bee space is much greater than 3 8 here. So we did have to rethink and then design the hives around the frame size that we came up with. So that kind of catches most everything uh, except for the what are we actually up to, uh, different kinds of things. And so we're hoping that you enjoyed the little bits of information. The style of hive and house has been really great for us. And that's kind of why we wanted to share it. It was really hard to find information, and we kind of thought that, well, maybe everybody deserves to have a better place to get information in close. The, there are some differences you need to think about is, for instance, the cost. The cost is more. And I mentioned that, that getting them, they do cost more, there's more to them. But on the other hand, my understanding from people that have had them a very long time is they last longer. Uh, Suzanne posted recently that the last 40 years. So, so if you're replacing your hive continuously, you've got to add that cost into yours. Uh, the U.S., things are new here. Supplies are not here. The design was not here. The information's not around. So it's harder to find information. It's harder to find supplies. Uh, we've been ordering, well, actually Dana gets to order from Slovenia. I was lucky enough that he wanted to build them too. And so we kind of had, had some stuff going there. So at this time, we would entertain any questions that people have. And usually I start and I work my way around the room. So, yeah. What happens when you uh, run out of room? Uh, you actually, it's meant to be tended. Remember I said you have to tend these hives? The hives uh, need to be tended. So you go through and you do your checkerboarding just like you might do uh, with a regular hive. And when it's full of honey, instead of adding a super on top, you extract. Uh -huh. And so you simply do it. Most of the hives, if you start doing your research, you'll find that they're too high. And so they're extracting more often is what they're doing. And so they're just, they're just tending them and they're extracting. So it's not, not such a huge issue. And I'm moving that way. I have a couple questions. Um, to, to add on to, to his question there, what do you do with a very large hive? How do you control colony numbers without affecting the, the production of the colony? Same, same thing you do the last step. You might do a split. So you just, you, you just pull out and split you're just, instead of putting you're the extra rolling, boxes you're doing on splits. You're, when, when, I'm trying to, when I was trying to grow my hive, I did checkerboarding. And so I, I, I did exactly what I did with the Langstroth hives, only in my hive. And can you, your display had three boxes high. Can you go higher than that? You can, minus, Deborah's gone this four. This is mine, minus four. I have 10 frames in each chamber. So 10, 20, 30, 40. And do you find that they, they fill up quickly? Like it depends on the bees. Uh, last year, my bees were new in there. I got them uh, late Ju uh, June, early July. The yellow hive I got early. The yellow hive went through three queens. I didn't do anything you need to know. Okay. I put a queen, I put one in there, I had a yellow queen, I looked a month later, and I had a red queen. So, oh. and, then, and, and, then, and then they didn't like her, and they got rid of her, and so September, they hatched a new queen, and so this, this hive was a small cluster, I mean like a little tiny cluster all winter in there, and so right now I have them in two chambers, because I think that with the, the constant changing of queens, they didn't fill up as much. And, and I believe, I, I think I might have an Italian, I'm not real sure, because it wasn't what I got. 
Um, this hive here, I started in July, and it has a Scatatraps queen. It filled up very quickly. I had a cluster this big I, all winter long. I kept saying, aren't these bees going to die? They must be dying. Oh, no, no, I have this huge cluster. They built up. They started brood early. They were out 50 degrees. They're out. They're out constantly. And this hive, I'm, I'm watching it real close. There's some empty, there's some, still some things that they need to put some honey on and, and some comb, but it is full of bees, and I'm planning on when we do queen rearing, pulling some stuff out of there to start a new one. Okay, and I've got a historical question so. also if I might. So historically, in the United States and, and in Europe, they would, they would start off with uh, bee caps made of straw. Oftentimes the bees were disposable. Historically, right. burn the bees out, take the honey, the bees would die. And they would culture uh, uh, swarming because of that. Uh, then when the Langstroth happened, that, that culture changed where we tried to stop swarming and tried to make our hives larger. And what happened in Slovenia? Did they have that culture of burn and take? I, I have not have read that at all. And, and, you know, needless to say, not everything's in English, so I you yeah. know, have to find things that I can read. You see what I'm saying there. But, yeah, and, and I, think, I think that partly is, in some of the areas, the climate is har harsher, so if, if there's, a longer, there's a longer season for your bees in some places than others. And so the short season, maybe the two-chamber was about all they could handle uh, for, for build-up and it didn't have as much. But I would do the same thing as far as splits and, and changes. They still would think of swarming. Them. I mean, none of that has changed as far as what they're doing. But I have not read anything on, on that, on, on the difference. From what I'm reading is they're following pretty much the rest of the bee history as far as the people that were involved seem to be doing the same things that was going on in Europe. Okay, thank you. So, and I'm, and I'm moving along to people that I saw. How do you, how do you hide your first pack of bees? How do you, you put the queen I, I in did, and just put the box up and okay. let them go in? Well, I, I, I'll tell you, I, we have two different things that we did. Got I did I did a, a, a five frame. No. And I brought my Langstroth frames home, except for one, one I did at the club. I removed the frames. I actually destroyed the frames entirely which meant that I had a chunk of foundation with comb, with bees, with honey, or brood, or whatever, and then I put it in my frame, and then I put it in my hive. Okay. A little bit messy, but once you've done a few of them, no problem, easy to do. Uh, Dana did For some packages, uh, there's a couple different ways you can do it. If you've got at least two chambers, which you typically will have, is you can either put the slotted board or even leave the board out and you can just put the bees inside and shake them out if that's what you want. What we did this year is we just left the 10 frames out of the second chamber and we put the, took the queen out, put her on a frame in the first chamber, and then we just laid the box in there sideways, came back two days later and pulled the box out. That was really now, easy. Last year I tried that and I don't know if anybody remembers how cold it was last April. I put the bees in there and I went back the next morning and I got home late from the club. It was about 4 o'clock when I did that. And when I went in there, 95% of the bees were still in the package, even though they were that far from the queen. So I put my uh, board here that slides at the bottom, and I took the package out, and I dumped them all out, and they just sat there in the pile. <laughs> I had to take my eye tool and a feather and slowly plow them into the eye. <laughs> and that was last this year. They all, I did uh, two hives at my place and the two at the club, and they all came right out just fine. Yeah, at the club they were packaging quite a few bees, and they've all got the lights and they're dumping, we got bees flying everywhere, and we've got ours, and we open it, and we just stick it in there and close the door. <laughs> and one guy came over and he says, this is way too easy. So I think I, I was up, I'm, I'm trying to keep moving around here. Yes. Uh, since you're working them from the inside and it's much darker in there than it is outside, do you find that you have less activity from guard bees and fielders coming in and harassing you while you're working the hive? I think I know I that have, bees do not like dark areas. I, I have less. I, I tend, we tend to work, I work a lot without any smoke, uh -huh. is, is that they're fairly calm. I, as I said, my Skatchatraz, that is a Russian mix. 
uh, Carnolian Russian and uh, Buckfest makes from Saskatchewan, Canada. And they are supposed to be more aggressive, which I did on purpose because of where I live. And I did, I, yesterday, is that yesterday or the day before? It, it must have been when, yesterday. I um, thought my queen was gone because I found a supersedure queen cell. And I went, ah, and I said a bad word. <laughs> and, and so I didn't see the queen. And I thought she was gone, so I thought, okay, so I, I need to do something here. And I thought, well, I could separate and I could do, you know, I could get one started. And so I decided to look through my hive. Now, this is my hive that is, this is this one. It is chock a block full of bees. There are, there are tons of bees in there. And I physically removed every frame. I moved my frames. I had my frames. I had bees stacked here and there. And I never got stung. I did not wear gloves. I do wear a veil. Um, you can I, also see I, that I you get a lot of natural light because yeah, it's I used smoke to make them go back in because they were in my way. Um, so I did, I did get some smoke when I was getting ready to put them back in, but not because they were bad. And so they seem to be calmer when, when I'm dealing with them and I'm really doing some. But I also find that if I just want to go in this chamber, I am not bothering this chamber down here. And so I think there's some calmness with that. And so I'm moving along, and I have not seen anybody up high, so I was working my way along here. Uh, I was in uh, Bosnia back in the 90s, and uh, uh, when I saw the AZ hives there, or the cassette hives, uh, do you put your bees in the bottom when you hive them, or do you put them in the top and let them work down? I put uh, mine in the bottom. In the bottom? And, and over the winter, uh, both hive worked up to the third chamber. And I'm telling them right now, they got to go back down, go back down. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm working on that right now. So. Also, also for ventilation in the wintertime, mm -hmm. uh, we use quilt boxes. Do you have a quilt box built into that? I, I did that because I was being paranoid. I treated, I had a mite infestation in September, October, November. So I'm, I'm treating in November, early 1st of December, I'm treating with oxalic acid. So I bring my little heater in, I set my heater so that when I open the hive, I don't get everything cold, and, and I was treating. So what I did for the winter, because I sealed it up, and then I discovered, you know, if you seal it all up, it gets wet in there. I mean, go figure that I did. I sealed it and didn't unseal it. That'll never happen again. And so I actually put boards in on my screen. I have insulation that sits here. This one's open. I open all the way up, and I did put a quilt box clear at the top and sugar. And, and there was no moisture at all. I did have ventilation uh, up here on the door. And so I, I probably did a little overkill. They don't have a space Overkill's designed good. to do the quilt. But what she did is she just used her fourth chamber yeah. and used that to put the quilt in. Okay. Because, because I have extra. Okay, other questions? I know there was another one someplace. What did you notice about your loss percentage? I had zero loss. I, I have two hives. Statistically, these numbers don't do anything for you. Okay. I'm very happy about it. I have, have the two hives. I have the yellow hive that had a cluster, I mean really, a little tiny, tiny cluster of bees all winter. I expected to lose it. It was a new queen. I mean, she had just laid like one back to the group before winter came. And I truly expected. She's, it's still a fairly small cluster, um, but they survived. And they're not. The other one, I had this huge cluster all winter, and I kept expecting to have a little bit of die off or something. And but that's pretty normal for the scattered houses; they have big clusters. And so and I had then, zero loss. And then, when you folks treat with oxalic acid, how do you introduce the burner, or how do you how do you treat? Um, it's different. Mine, I have a space down here, and I just slip it in, and then I close my doors. Mm -hmm. And then I leave the space. Uh, mine is in a shelter, and and so there's you know a lot of airflow and stuff around. <coughs> Thanks. So. Yeah, and that's the one thing I found with my current design here is when I designed it, I, I put this uh, slot down below for a tray, thinking that you know when it was time to treat, I could go in the bee house, pull that tray out, and slide it under there. Two problems with that. I've had people tell me that they've tried putting their vaporizers underneath the 8th inch screening and it, it restricts it. It doesn't go up into the hive. Also, when I stack mine six boxes high, 
I made my bee house pretty small, and I didn't even put that on the, the, this one here. It's got the little 3 8 tray, but that 3 8 is not quite enough. And the front doesn't work real well. So if I wanted to use the vaporizer in this style of hive, I would have to open it up, take at least one or two frames out, and then make a slightly different back door that's similar to the feeding door, which has a little notch in it. And I would have to notch it. Now, I didn't do that last year. I ended up, for various reasons, mostly lack of queens, because I tried to requeen one of my hives. When I tested late in the year, I still didn't have any mites. So I didn't treat. This year, I think I'm going to try one of the things our club did on many of our hives was an oxalic acid drip. And it's a little more challenging with this than a Langstrop, but that's what I'm going to try on mine. The other problem is, I still haven't, I'm very safety minded. Part of my previous job was uh, safety. And I can't find any information that says, you know, they say, do your hive and then come back basically 20 minutes later and you can pull the stuff out. Well, that's a hive that's out in the open air, wind's blowing by. I've got a sealed bee house. So if I vaporize inside the bee house, when is it safe for me to go back in? And that data doesn't exist. So I haven't been able to find it. You know, how long does it take to break down? So two questions. How are you going to treat the drip? What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the second chamber, and I'm going to pull all 10 frames out and put it on that 10-frame stand. And I'm going to drip them on the stand. And then I'm just going to put a piece of plastic flexible tubing this long and either pull out the separator or just try dripping through the separator into the, sec the lower chamber. And after I treat, I'll let you know how it goes. So on your lower screens, is that with the removal one, is that dealing with your dead loss screen through the winter? Yeah. If the bees die and fall to the bottom, how are you get them out of it? Uh, what you need to do is, and, and I had one hive that died out completely, and all I did was just take the frames out and clean. But yeah, if you wanted to, you could go in and make a small tool that went in this 3 8 gap, but that'd be a royal pain. Yeah. I, I had mine, because I have a space down, down at the bottom here, and it's, it's you know, big enough space, is I just, just kind of scraped out. Okay. Them, and I, My surviving guy didn't I, have very many dead bees in the bottom. Yeah, I pull it, the, the, one, the one I had a ton, and I pulled, when I did my acid acid, I pulled that separator board out so that it can flow up easier. And that, that allows the flow to happen. Could you incorporate a screen at the bottom of that where you can just slide the screen out and catch the dead loss and just slide out and dump it and put it back in? Well, you could. Um, what you would have to do is this, where this 3 8 board inch goes, you would have to make a tray that was only 3 8 of an inch deep. So you could do that. Otherwise, as soon as you move that screen, you're adding extra space. Uh, and I do make mine modular, and I give people the screen bottom, but not everybody likes screen bottom. So you could make any kind of bottom you wanted to. You could leave the screen off if you wanted to, and then it would go into this tray down here. So. Yeah, I didn't find it a problem. Sorry to test you again. No. I bet a bathroom fan would work well with oxalic acid in one of these where you just make it almost like a fume hood. Yeah. Uh, but a uh, question on the on the uh, swarm cells. Uh, if you were dragging the frame along the bottom, yep. do they still build the swarm cells on the bottom of the frame? They can, and some other people have asked if you, you know, one of the things you can do is you can look in through the end, and if, you, if you're worried about swarm cells, you can't actually look for them. And if you have a swarm cell at the bottom that you want to keep, what you do is you pull out three or four frames, and then you take the frame that's got the swarm cell, pull it just enough to get it out of the, um, these guys in the back, and then just tilt the frame sideways and pull it out okay. if you wanted to keep it. But anything that they put on the bottom, when you go across those rods, it's going to clean it off for you. <laughs> yeah. So, automatic swarm cells. I've never removed. had swarm cells. I've never seen Teach them to put them on the top as well as they do. What about drifting when you have all the hives next to and above each other? They say that it's, you know, and I haven't really noticed the problem. I, I only had two hives last year. This year I have three. I'm hoping to expand that to five, got five hives installed. Um, but they say that it's usually not a big issue, uh, especially when you, that's one of the reasons they paint them, is just to give the bees an orientation. Yeah, I, I haven't heard a big issue for the people that, I, that I've been communicating with that have them. 
And, and I, did, I did some specific things with paintings. Uh, my yellow hive has the yellow landing board, and the blue hive has a blue landing board, and I did patterns. When I was reading, I did some reading about color and design and <coughs> to see what the bees were seeing. And there are certain colors that they do better with, and then patterns. And so I specifically made patterns for them to find things. And then I made the same pattern throughout their hive. So, and I did that in the club hive also. Mm -hmm. so, Orientation? Do you, for your entrances? Yeah, they come for out. This, for, this, for this area, do you particularly face where you're building this? Your entrance is facing east or? Mine are um, south. Mine are south to southeast, probably uh, more south and southeast. And most of the stuff I've read, they said you generally shoot for about southeast, but it partly depends on your property. You know, where you're getting the sun, where you're getting prevailing winds. Mine was partly based on where I wanted to build. There was only one way to face it. It just happened to be south, which just seemed to work pretty well for me. Yeah, mine's out in the pasture with llamas, and so it's facing south because that was convenient. It was the, my husband's solar shelter that I just many indicated that I needed it. Many <laughs> traditional houses will have bees on both sides, so if one side's facing south, the other one's facing north. Right. So. Other questions? Can't have answered everything. Tsunami alert. The uh, traditional AZ high is about twice that size. They're about four times this size. Uh, they're, they're, they're ten and ten. ten. Uh, are you guys the ones that advertise you're on uh, Whidbey Island up there? Oak Harbor area? No, we went to Whidbey Island recently, though. Yeah. Pardon? But we spoke at Whidbey Island's group recently. This is the difference on the frame size. Okay. The reason I was asking about the Whidbey Island thing is I had a friend that was out here for a summer and lived in Georgia. And one of his trips back, he talked, stopped in Georgia and talked to the guy about the AZI. Right. And, right. and yeah. the fellow back there says, well, I got my information from the guy out there at Whidbey Island. Really? Yeah, and, and I, I suspect that if we really looked around our country and the other countries, we would find people from Sylvania that brought, brought their hive styles, and they did it. It just has not really been advertised around and about, and so, yeah, so it's, it's you know they're out there. If there is somebody on Woodby, though, that's doing AC hives, we'd love to chat with them. Yeah, and they, they were not at the Bee Association meeting. The, the, uh instructions you said you found online for the AZ hives. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen the same set and they're uh, very minimal. They're interesting. And they're, they're written in what, Slovenian? Serbo Croatian. You, you, <laughs> you, you, you can understand and they're very poor. Yep. And, and there's, there's a variety of, when I did my research, uh, I, I found a variety of bits and pieces and then people were very selfish about sharing their information, what they were doing, and there were only a few of them out there. And some of them, some people do better at showing you how they do something than others. Some, some do better on their drawings and explanations. When I did my drawings, and, and, and I do art, and so mine are creative. But I did, I did make the numbers right, and I showed it to my daughter, who's an engineer. She's a structural engineer. She looks at it, she goes, Mom, you need more, more statistics, more numbers. Mom, this one isn't perfect, you know. And so, so my daughter went through mine and she goes, well, you need to change this, and she wrote little things on it and stuff. And so mine's a little bit better than if I'd done it myself. I would have had the numbers there, but she made me put a lot more numbers down. Uh, and, and sometimes the drawings are hard, but I, I found it very difficult to find information. And, and it came in bits and pieces. One of the fellows in the Olympia Club <coughs> bought a hive from Slovenia that shipped it over, and he was he's an engineer. Let's go to redesign it to fit the landscape frames. I like what you guys did with the frames. That <coughs> Thank you. that way you can get parts. That's that's why we did it. Is is as you look at the research, it it, it was apparent right away that it wasn't going to work. And there were only a couple people out there. And as I was doing research and chatting with people, you know, you chat with Suzanne, and she goes, oh, yeah, no problem. You'll just get something else. And I'm thinking, 
well, I got to work something special. And uh, I just didn't want to do that. And it's worked out well. I mean, I was able to take apart the legs from frames to put the foundation in. So it's, it's worked for me to have that change. And now it's done, and I don't have to worry about it. There's two closed groups on Facebook, AZ Hiders and AZ Hive Creators, that you can join. And the creators have a file <coughs> with CAD CAM prints now, just now. There's a lot more information now. And so if somebody is serious, I, I put up a flyer that gives some they're science they're to try and follow them. But at right. least somebody is posting them. And I don't know if you, if you... Dana builds and sells these. So your next best shot is Texas. So Dana is very talented and is willing to work with you on design modifications, so please make sure you're in contact. Yeah, and if you took one of the uh, trifold brochures, it's got my email and Deborah's, and we're happy to answer questions. And, and as I said, we're doing the AZ Hive Day Saturday, but we don't mind visitors, uh, because we, we know this information is fairly new, and you can't just go down the street and say, oh, somebody in my club's got to have one. 